الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا رسول الله وعلى آله ومن ولا اللهم افتح لنا فتح العارفين وفقنا توفيق الصالحين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وقرب زدنا علما الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, first of all thank uh, you for all the um, the wonderful comments i was told uh, they got a lot of positive comments so i want to just thank everybody for having a good opinion may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you uh, may allah bless your ramadan inshallah and um, we're here looking at uh, ibn juzail kalbi's work on uh, at-tasili ulum at-tanzir particularly his muqaddimah and then i'm going to look at a few other things including imam al-ghazali's uh, uh, theory of al-jawahir in the quran uh, Imam al-Ghazali has a very interesting book uh, where he looks at the the most important, what he, what, what he called the jawahir, which here really means essences, but they're the jewels of the Qur'an, and he uses that uh, terminology. Uh, in, I, I, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi uh, عنه, is one of the great scholastics of uh, the 8th century. He died in 741. He, he, he was... Um, an Andrusian from Granada, and he had the uh, great fortune of uh, living uh, when there was still a very strong uh, tradition there. Uh, it, it, it broke down, obviously, um, and eventually led to the loss of Andrusia. But in his, uh, in his themes of Quran, he, um, he basically looks at seven, what he, what he considered to be the seven themes that the Quran goes into. And so I'm going to be looking at that uh, today, those seven themes. But before I did, I actually wanted to uh, look at uh, something from another Andrusian who uh, influenced uh, the great Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, who was Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi. And Qadi Abu Bakr, uh, عنه, he wrote uh, two tafsirs. One is called Ahkam al-Quran, which is in four volumes, very famous work. It's one of the most important works on the juristic aspect of the Qur'an. Um, he was a student of uh, the great uh, Hujjat al-Islam Abu Hamad al-Ghazali. And um, he, uh, one of the most really extraordinary uh, scholars, but he wrote his rihla and he talked about first meeting Imam al-Ghazali. And he was actually the, the last person that Imam al-Ghazali took as a kind of personal student. And that, that was how brilliant he was. But he, um, he, in his Ahkam al-Quran, his other Quran, unfortunately, which was apparently uh, 30 volumes, uh, was lost. So a lot of the Andalusian works uh, we don't have. Um, he, he mentions in Surah Al-Baqarah uh, the verse, أَلَمْ تَرَى إِلَى الَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَهُمْ أُلُوفْ حَذَرَ الْمَوْتِ Haven't you seen those who left their homes in the thousands out of fear of death. Allah, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, uh, die. And then after that, he brought them back. So he mentions that the, the reason for this was because of a plague, uh, a waba that ha had afflicted um, uh, the people of Bani Israel. So he says, and Bani Israel, ta'un ta in, in Arabic generally means the black plague but it actually can mean also any epidemic or pandemic. But, but if it's used on its own, uh, it just, it means the black plague. But an epidemic also would have, uh, would have been, uh, they're, they're called waba or obia. And uh, influenza was certainly something in the pre-modern world. Um, some Arabs have suggested that it's from influenza, which is the, the, uh, the because it's uh, it's always wet, you know. So, but anyway, that's that's one of those very dubious uh, etymologies. So he says in here that um, they fled the uh, they fled uh, the the plague, and um, because of that, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala caused them to die, really as a punishment for fleeing the plague. So this this is something relevant to us. So what he says here now is that Abd Rahman ibn Awf said, سَمِعْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ سَلَمْ يَقُولُ إِذَا سَمِعْتُمْ بِهِ بِأَرْضٍ 
فلا تقدموا عليه وإذا وقع بأرض وأنتم بها فلا تخرجوا فرارا منه This hadith which is a sound hadith متفق عليه it's Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim related This hadith actually came from a, a situation where Omar was with the Sahaba and they, they were on their way to Sham and then they heard about Ta'un Amwas and so Omar was thinking about going just continuing on the journey and they he actually brought he had a shura he had the Quraysh and then he had the Ansar and they had a shura and then uh, it was Abdul Rahman ibn Auf who brought this hadith and this is important because the Sahaba did not necessarily know all of the hadith there's there's approximately there's over 30,000 I mean out of the sound hadith it's it's a smaller number but there there are some some will put them up to almost uh, 54,000 hadith so there there were a lot of hadith that the Sahaba might not have known or heard that the Prophet said it in a gathering and he might have said it in with one of the Sahaba so that happens in the Ahad hadith sometimes it's only one person that relates it from the companion so the Prophet mentioned this uh, that if you hear about it, bihi, in other words, al waba, because this was in the context of a conversation with Omar, in a, a place, bi ardin, meaning just a geographical area, don't go into that area. Wa ida waqa bi ardin, wa antum biha, fadatah khrujo firaran minhu. But if it happens and you're in it, don't flee from it. So, you know, it's very interesting to note how they viewed this, because I think a lot of modern scholars attempt to create this idea of the infectious nature, that this was about the infection and preventing infection. In fact, in our tradition, we really believe in the inertness of, of, of things. I mean, we do assert sababiyya, and so it's not to deny causation. Causation is real, but we, we also understand that there's no causation without God, that God is the one that is ultimately the cause of all things, and, and, um, and so, it's very important to, to, to reflect deeply on this pre-modern worldview, which is so different from our worldview. So here's what he says about it. So our scholars differed about why the Prophet ﷺ would have said that. Now, obviously, we could argue now he said it because of infectious disease. Um, and, and that would be probably a more modern Argument, but look at how they looked at it. The first, the Prophet said, told us, do not, uh, do not put yourselves in situations. He said in a hadith, al mu'minu la yudhillu nafsa. The believer should not humiliate himself or put himself in position of idlal, where he's uh, he's in a in, in a in a humbled. Uh, situation and they asked him how do you do it and he said that he puts himself in a situation of tribulation that he's not able to to withstand so so he's warning us about that and and so in this hadith um they're saying that that's the reason it's which the prophet prohibited us from doing uh, and this is why even in traditionally in in war you don't you don't go into a situation where you're going to lose, right? The, the Muslims, in fact, there's a British historian of military history who argued that the reason the Muslims were so effective is because fleeing the battlefield was not shameful uh, if the odds were, were against them, right? Because in pre-modern battles, they often fought till they were either dead or slaves, Whereas in the Islamic tradition, you can't, the Zahab, you can't flee. It's like min al kabair But if the, the general or whoever's in charge calls for a retreat, that was dishonorable in pre-modern warfare. Where, whereas the Muslims, became, and so uh, that was, uh, so that's one aspect there of the, so he says, لا يجوز في حكم الله تعرف إن صيانة النفس because to protect or guard the self from everything that's makru is an obligation. Any, anything that is fearful or, 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 or harmful is an obligation. And the second opinion, because 
بما يرى من عموم الالام وشموم الاسقام so in other words you don't put yourself in a situation that you're going to become so preoccupied and anxious about it because this is the human condition that it will it will preoccupy you from doing what you're created to do which is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's a, a beautiful explanation with that it the third opinion ma yukhafu min as-sakhat 'inda nuzul al-bala bihi wa dhahab as-sabr 'ala ma yanzuru min al-qada the fear that you will actually get angry at the decree so people or lose your patience so that's that's a real fear for people because people do lose their faith people can be tested with a, you know they lose their child and suddenly they lost their faith and i've seen that happen which to me is you know i would hate to have that tribulation and may Allah preserve all of you and 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 myself but it's not yours in the first place i mean allah gives and allah takes back so that we have a istislam about these things where it's this is allah's business not our business and and there's a great lesson in surah al-kahf with al-khadr and uh and the boy that he kills you know that you don't know what you know what the outcome of something is so the 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 fourth reason ma yukhafu an min su'l i'tiqad it's a fear that they will actually have a, have a their aqidah will be corrupted because of the belief of infection so they'll think that it was the disease that they it was because of the plague that they got the disease instead of seeing it as the qadr the that that this is from allah it's because nothing afflicts you except allah decreed it for you and so it's the belief that there's actually going to be a corruption so so kan yaqul as if he could say laula dukhuli fi hadha albalad lama nazara biya min makru like had i not gone there this wouldn't have happened well it could happen wherever you are it's like when the bedouin the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said la adwa wa la tira the one of he said there's no infectious diseases and and uh, again this is haqiqa so don't think he's not negating because he also said firru min al majdumi kama tafirru min al asad that's in sahih al bukhari flee from the leper like you flee from a lion so it, again it's really important to remember that this is not this we have bifocal spiritually we have bifocal vision we have sharia and we have haqiqa and and our our deen has always understood that distinction between those two so that's really important to remember so we assert causation we don't deny it but we also recognize that it's allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the end and and this is what we have to see and so that's all for going into Now look at the difference for leaving. وَأَمَرْ خُرُوجٍ فَإِنَّمَا نُهِيَ عَنْهُ لِمَا فِيهِ مِنْ تَرْكِ الْمَرْضَاءِ Because they would abandon the sick people. So there's no mercy in it. Like they, the healthy people have an obligation to stay and take care of the sick people. مِنْ تَرْكِ الْمُهْمَلِينَ مَعْمَا يَنْتَظِمُ بِهِ مِمَّا تَقَدَّمَ وَاللَّهُ عَلَمْ So they have an obligation to help them. Right? so uh and then the other one uh, the the marki is actually considered going into uh was makru uh if, if you had yaqeen whereas leaving it was haram so they actually made a distinction that you could go in to help them for instance like it's not a absolute prohibition as long as you had yaqeen that whatever happened to you was from god so i thought that would be useful just as a um this i mentioned yesterday and just to to reiterate a few things one the, he's looking at the the purpose of the quran in terms of its summary purpose so the jumla all together and he said the first thing was it was it was da'wat al-khalq ila ibadat al-haqq wa dukhul fi dinihi so it's an invitation to creation to enter into the religion with god and to 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 worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and 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 then he said that there there's bawa'ith that go with that so there there's going to be incentives allah subhanahu wa ta'ala incentivizes incentivizes it so now if you get into what's called what he calls the tafsil right he gives the seven uh, here meanings that the purposes of the quran so the first one is ilm al-rububiyyah 
which is to teach you about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the fundamental and primary purpose of the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, right? I mean, Allah begins in the name of Allah. If you take the Shafi'i position, if you take the Maliki, it's Alhamdulillah. The Quran begins with Alhamdulillah. But it begins with Allah. It ends with Nas. So the last word in the Quran is Nas. So it begins with Allah, it ends with Nas. And between the two is the message message of Allah to Nas. So this is the book of Allah that, that is sent to humanity. And so um, the ilm al-rububiyyah is to know Rabbul Alameen. And that's why he begins, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. It begins with rububiyyah. Like, who's your Lord? You are, you're lorded over. You are marbub. You're, you're, you're makhluq. You know, and your very createdness should intellectually uh, demand a, 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 a recognition that, there, that there's a creator. This idea that this kind of modern quantum view that things just popped into existence, it's a little hard to swallow for uh, people that just think even superficially about what, like where, because we know that this wasn't here forever. We, we know this, even our material sciences had indicated that. Um, but and even the most primitive peoples have always understood that, and not because they were primitive, but because they were they were human, right? So no matter how intellectual you get, no matter how intelligent you get, it's that's not the reason um, that uh, you know you're you're denying Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You're denying Allah Subhanahu wa Taala because your fitra has been so distorted by civilization and by uh, a kind of abstraction in your mind. And this is why the vast majority of uh, human beings have believed in some force outside of themselves, whether it was animistic or, or, um, or um, polytheistic. They believed that there was something outside of themselves, whereas modern man is unique in this, in this way. Modern human beings are very strange. So that's ilm al rububiyya The second one is nubuwa. So th there, the Quran comes to tell us about prophecy. And now one of the most amazing things about prophecy is if, if you study philosophy, every philosopher will negate the philosophy of their teachers or the ones that went before them. They'll just differ with them. So and beginning with uh, uh, Socrates and Plato and then Plato and Aristotle, I mean, beginning in the beginning, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Or the pre-Socratics, who somebody said everything's fire, and then somebody said every, everything's water, somebody said everything's fire. And, and they're all differing. The prophets, if you study the prophets, they don't differ. And they come over a period of like a thousand years, and yet they're all saying the same thing, that there's a God, you're, here's what he wants you to do, and then... Uh, you're going to be judged. You're going to be raised up and you're going to be judged. And, and you have a soul. They're consistent in that. Where they differ is in the sharia, in the details of the law because of the times and places. That's where they differ. But they don't differ in what are called the thawabit. You know, there's thawabit and mutagayyarat. There, there's, you know, the, the sharia is, is uh, it differs, but the aqidah is the same. So the aqidah remains the same. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that all of the prophets are brothers from different mothers. So the mothers are the, are the, are the sharia, but the father is the aqidah. So it's the same father, but, but the, the mother is different. So the, 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 the aqidah is the same. That's the father. But the mother is the sharia. And so he said, there, we're all brothers uh, but but illat banu illat, which means we have different mothers. So the Sharia is different, but our father is the same. It's the it's the haqiqah. So uh, the, and then the next one is the maad, which is resurrection. So maad means the place you're going back to, right? The Eid in Arabic is from ad yaudu, right? So it's so maad is the place you go back to. So inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun. We were already there, and we have this recollection. You know, Plato called it the recollection. You know, this this memory of a previous life. You know, we all have this embedded somewhere in our souls, and it it comes up 
uh, periodically through life where we kind of have these strange uh, moments of uh, things like deja vu and other things where, uh, you know, I, I recognize something. And then you have al-ahkam, which are the, the rulings, the, the sharia itself. So, so, so divinities, uh, prophecies, resurrection, or eschatology, you know, what happens after life. And then ahkam. And then the ahkam relate to, uh, we'll get into that, what they relate. And then finally, al-wa'ad, al-wa'id, and al-qasas. So al-wa'ad is the promise in Arabic. So, إِذَا أَعِيدُكَ شَيْئًا هَذَا wa'ad. You know, so a wa'ad is a promise to, 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 to do something. A wa'id is a threat. You know, and it's, you know, it's the same as one of these Arabic things where they, they have the same root, but they mean very different things. So, uh, you know, u'iduka, like, uh, you know, wayhaka, Yusuf, like if I make a threat like that, and then you have to, you know, okay. Now, the nice thing about the Arab tradition, which is, is in our understanding of aqidah, is that Allah can break his, uh, his threat and it doesn't diminish him in his uh, lordship. So if Allah says, uh, I'm going to punish you, and then on Yom Qiyamah he says, I forgive you, that is actually acceptable in Aqidah, whereas he won't break his promise. So the promise will be fulfilled if he promises us, but the threat that's up to him. فَعَلُوا لِمَا يُرِيدُ right? And so, and then you have uh, Al-Qasas, which are the stories. Now, one of the most extraordinary things about this, um, this division is all of them are in the Fatiha. So the Fatiha is, it's Umm Al-Kitab in that way because it has, it has all of the, it's the matrix of all of the meanings of the Quran. So you have you have the ma'ad. You have the ahkam. You have the nabuwa. You know, the sirat al an'amt min al nabiyin wa siddiqin wa shuhada wa salihin. Right? And then you have the, uh, uh, the, the wa'id. Ghayr al maghdubi alayhim. Wa al Bi qasas. Like the. The, all the qasas of so it's all there in Fatiha. All of these meanings can be perceived in the Fatiha. So that's quite extraordinary. Um, so now uh, we're going to, uh, inshallah, go into uh, these details. And I'll just do this one and then we'll open up for question and answer, inshallah. So in the Jumla, which is the summation of it, the Quran invites creation to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and enter into his deen. So that delineates worship. First of all, there has to be a, a bayan, a clarification of who your Lord is that you're being called to and what is his deen that, 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 that you're being called to. And so that, that's where you get the usul al-aqaid, which are the foundations of belief. And this is what we call usul al-deen. It's, it's also called ilm al-kalam. And ilm al-kalam in the first few centuries uh, was a very negative term. But over time, the Muslims adopted it, the ulama. So, so when you see a lot of attacks, I mean, some of these modern books, you get uh, these scholars that write books against um, kalam. And they'll quote like Imam Shafi or they'll quote the early scholars that how evil kalam is. That's all true. Those are all true. But kalam in that early period meant something different from the later period. And so it's, it's important to be aware of that because you will see negative statements about kalam, but it, it, it's a technical term. It's like tasawwuf, a lot of people don't like that term, but the ulama used it. I mean, they adopted it. So there's, ne there's bad kalam, there's bad Sufism, there, all these things have negative downsides, but as a technical term, it was adopted for theology, um, what we would call dialectical theology, which is, is is it gets into a, a more th a theoretical things so um and they considered it necessary and that's why all, a lot of the greatest scholars were mutakallimun uh, like imam al juwayni and imam al ghazali and others so and then, then the second is the ahkam al amal so that's the deen so you're being called to 
Allah. And so that's the aqidah to teach you who your Lord is. And then you're being called to enter into his deen. And so that is the ahkam al-amal. And, and those will go into the uh, ahkam al-badaniyya, ahkam al-qalbiyya, right? Ahkam al ijtimaiya I mean, there's different, like siyasa shara'iyya, there's different types of ahkam, all right? That, so your, your personal rulings, that relate to you personally, the rulings that relate to your transactions with others, and then also uh, there's rulings that relate to like the ruler that don't apply to us or the government, things like that. But then that also provides uh, motivation to do this repeatedly. So how does Allah entice us into, uh, into um, this deen? And that's with al-jazar wal-asa. I mean, this is Basically, we are designed to respond to carrots and sticks. This is the human condition. And Allah created us, so he knows us better than anybody. Not everybody, um, Rabi al adawi is a great example. Not everybody is motivated by the carrot and the stick, but the vast majority of human beings are motivated by the carrot and the stick. And so this is targhib and tarheeb. So the Quran has tar targhib, and that's the majority, believe it or not. So the majority is actually encouraging. And then the, the tarheeb is to, 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 to create fear in you. Like, I don't want to. And that's out of the love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for his creation is the warning uh, that you warn people you love. If you don't care, if somebody's headed for a cliff and, you know, he holds your mortgage, you know, um, a lot of people will just let them fall over that cliff. You know, you're going to warn people that you actually care about, right? And that's why the prophets warn everybody because they care about all of humanity. So, um, so that's where we are. And then tomorrow we're going to go into, inshallah, uh, these uh, in detail and give some examples from the Quran, inshallah. And then, uh, you know, when we get to the qasas, um, I want to get into and, and give you some really interesting examples of repetition in the Quran and why repetition really is much deeper than, than uh, it appears outwardly um, when, when, when you look at things. You'll see uh, like in, in, in one ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the ithna asharata uh, ayna, it says in fajarat ithna ta'ashara. I know, you know, in Fajrat, but in another ayah it says in Bajasat, you know, and, and these are two different words that have very different meanings. Um, I mean, they both apply to water flow, but you'll see why in one ayah Allah uses in Fajrat, and in another ayah He uses in, in, in Bajasat, you know, because they're, they're, they're related to the meaning and the secret of the, of the Quran. Uh, again, we get back to the, the impossibility of imitating the, the, uh, the balagha of the Qur'an. And, and you will see, the deeper you go into balagha, and this is why balagha in the trivium, all right, you're going to get debates on this, okay? But in the trivium, the master science is balagha. It's not grammar and it's not rhetoric because balagha presupposes grammar and rhetoric. Balagha is the master science. And this is why uh, civilizations are always obsessed with balagha when they're strong. They're obsessed with two things. Uh, in, 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 when civilizations are vibrant, there are two things they're obsessed with. Uh, space and law. Space is quantitative science. Law is qualitative space and order in the heavens law is understanding order in the earth stars and bars i mean it's very interesting that america took as a flag stars and bars and 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 what is what is the most potent tool uh, in in law it's persuasion because when you want to legislate something you have to persuade that body of lawmakers, that this is a good thing. And, and where does persuasion, what is the science of persuasion? Rhetoric. And so astronomy and, uh, and rhetoric, right? This, this is it, it's all, it's all in there. So uh, 
Harun. Akhi Harun. Questions? Yes, answers? sir. Barakallah. Harun has a lot of answers too. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you so much for what you have taught us so far, mashallah. First question is, what is your opinion on the omission of the Bismillah from Surah Tawbah? There is the idea that it was never clarified by the Sahaba, but is that just sebab to the true meaning that this is God's final call? The, I mean, the, the, the main reason that Imam Madik, first of all, saw that the, the ayahs, uh, the Basmala was only an ayah in Surah Al Ankabut. That was Madik's opinion. I, I tend to feel like that really is the strongest opinion because the thing about the Quran, there's no khilaf about the Quran. So the fact there's a khilaf about the Basmala means that, that I think his opinion is the soundest opinion. In the hadith, uh, Al Qudsi, it says, "Qasamtu baini al fatihata baini wa baina abdi." That's in Sahih al Bukhari. "Qasamtu al fatihata baini wa baina abdi." Faida qala abdi, "Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin." With all respect to the Shafi'is, because they have to recite the Basmala in the uh, in the Fatiha. But um, so that's that's a opinion. Now, Imam Malik saw the Basmala as they were to demarcate the beginnings of the surahs. This is why if you read Nafi'ah, which is the Qira'a of the Malikis in North Africa, in Libya, they recite Qalun, in the rest, uh, they recite um, Warsh. Uh, Sudanese actually recite uh, Abu Amr, I think. Um, but the Malikis recite um, because Nafi'ah was the Muqri of Medina. And so in, in, in the Maliki uh, school, the Basmala is a, it separates, and that's why when you read it, it's mandub to say the basmala, but you do, you don't have to when you when you recite the 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 uh, the recitation of Nafi' Warsh Imam Warsh, like they recite in Morocco and Mauritania. So in here, um, you know it, that he he says that uh, Ibn Juzay says, "What to sama surat al-Tawbah, to sama aydan al-Fadiha." So it's also the, 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 the scandalizer because it's, it scandalizes the hypocrites, right? Uh, right? So there's a difference of opinion about why that is. So he says that that Uthman ibn Affan saw that it got uh, uh, confused with um, Anfal before it. Like, and so they were called, the two went together. So they were called the Qarinatain. So they didn't separate between the two because the meanings are so related in Surat Al-Anfal and Surat Al-Tawbah. So that was Uthman ibn Affan's fi zamani ra. Walidharika qurinat bainuhuma fa, right? So they're put into uh, uh, into the sab'a tiwal, right? Wa kana sahaba qad akhtarafu hal huma suratani aw sura wahida, right? Are they one or they're two? Um, فَتُرِكَتَ الْبَسْمَلَ بَيْنَهُمَا لِذَارِكَ وَقَارَ عَلِي بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبْ الْبَسْمَلَ أَمَان So Ibn, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib said the Basmala is a security, right? وَالْبَرَاءَةُ نَزَلَتْ بِالسَّيْفِ So I mean the very beginning of it is بَرَاءَةٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ عَهَدْتُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Like it's telling them they're given four months and then, you know, uh, so it's it's there's a real threat. This is a surah that has a, a intense wa'id, and so it's inappropriate for the basmala to be in a wa'id. And this is why there's a famous story about uh, uh, I think it was um, uh, Al Asma'i uh, was reciting the Quran once, and he recited the surah about the sariqa wa sariqa uh, and then he says. Uh, in Allah Ghafur Rahim. And, and the Bedouin said to him, 
هذا كلام مان he said هذا كلام رب العالمين he said مستحيل it's impossible and he said well, and then he went back he realized he made a mistake on the ayah he said غفور رحيم and he said oh عزيز نحكي he said that's Allah's be and he said why why did you know that he said because you can't say cut off the hand and say then he's merciful and forgiving لكن عزة فحكمة right so so that's the that, that's what it, 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 you know the the rhetoric is called uh, it's 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 al maqal al hal right so it has to be appropriate with the circumstances and this is why in this in these circumstances to say bismillah rahman rahim it would be more appropriate to say bismillah al hakam al muntaqim or something like that or al aziz al hakim but Allah left it just bara'atum min Allah wa rasuli. Khalas. Yeah. Next one. Thank you for that. Next question is In regards to storytelling in the Quran being a powerful tool, what is your opinion of writing quote unquote Islamic fiction, especially in times? where there is a need for halal avenues for leisure and thought? Great question. Not only writing, but I think also Muslims have to produce really world-class um, literature, film, all of these things. Muslims should be, you know, aqibu bi mithni ma'uqibtum bihi. Allah says, fight them with what they fight you with. You know, and uh, it's there's a story about the, the, the man who... Um, you know, the, the, uh, the founder of the Salvation Army, you know, he used to write these uh, um, hymns with the tunes of popular songs, the very popular songs. And somebody said to him, you know, why are you using popular songs to, to you know, put hymns to? And he said, I don't want the devil to have all the best tunes, you know. So that's part of the problem is that, you know, uh, the demonic stuff, I mean, it's like Christian uh uh, cinema is really it's tends to be really poor generally um, and that's unfortunate that's not the way it should be I mean obviously the demons are helping the other ones I think <laughs> so they get the, the extra boost um, but I would say it's very important also fiction our tradition the Prophet has told the story it's one of my favorite hadiths the, the story of Um Zara um, is that a, a true story um, Allahu uh, alam, but the the way it's told, it's it's an incredible piece of literature, just as a as an event. And the Prophet also used uh, stories as as uh, examples, uh, things like this. We know that the Prophet only spoke the truth, um, but the uh, the ulama wrote, for instance, the maqamat, which I mean, I when I was studying Arabic many many years ago, and I dip into them every once in a while, but um, I love the maqamat uh, genre, which is uh, fiction. And these were great ulama. Al-Hariri was a great alim. Uh, Badi'u zaman al-Hamadani was a great alim and a great, you know, very pious man. Uh, uh, and uh, as Jarullah Zamakhshari wrote his maqamat in the haram. So the maqamat are amazing uh, fictionalized stories. One of the things that I learned you know, in thinking about the maqamat, because like Badi' Zaman al Hamadani in his uh, maqamat, the character of Abu Fatah al Iskandari is a nasab. He's, he's a charlatan, he's a con artist, but he's a religious con artist. And I, I really felt that he was warning people about people that use religion and con people with religion, that that character is a real character. He's, he's worse than a mafioso. I'll take a don any day of the week so he's there, you know but a religious charlatan who uses religion to fool people and we're more susceptible to being fooled by uh, piety than we are by other things because it's so hard if you're a, just an ordinary average common to type of person it's so difficult for you to imagine somebody using god to trick people it's really hard for people that are normal because it's, it's such an enormity. And so uh, 
uh, fiction is really important and 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 but but i think it should be good like i'm i ha i you know i i really think muslims should get back to itqan and ihsan and there's a lot of people that just it's like poetry it's better to memorize great poetry and be a rawi than to write really bad poetry i mean that's my opinion you know and people love to hear poems recited they they sound much better when they're recited than when they're read but the arabs have that tradition of the rawi they they weren't poets but they loved poetry so they would just memorize a bunch of poetry and then they would recite it you know so uh but we're in an age you know somebody asked fran Leibowitz, you know what advice do you give to young writers and she said stop writing you know and and uh, you know her point which she uh, elaborates on was that the self-esteem movement has made everybody think they're talented. And, and first of all, you can learn to write, uh, but it takes a long time to really become a, a good writer. And uh, so that, that's where I would say, you know, learn how to write first and, and, and it takes time. And that means learning rhetoric. It means reading a lot of great literature. Um, Next one. Thank you for that. There are multiple questions, mashallah. Um, lots of questions in common about the structure of the Quran that we have today in terms of juz and, and the suwar. So it looks like if I were to summarize it, it's could you elaborate further on the structure that we have Right. Well, I mean, the, the Muslims uh, traditionally, the Sunnah was to, to read, the, the Sunnah of the Muslims was to read the, the Mus'haf uh, at, at least once a month. So you did it 12 times a year. In Ramadan, they tended to maybe do it uh, two, four, uh, or more times. Um, and in fact, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ complained, it uh, you know, you know, my people have taken this Quran, have abandoned it. In the commentaries, they say that if you read it twice a year, that you're not under that hukum. But if it's less than that, then it's, it's like you've abandoned the Quran, you know. So uh, it's good to read it. So for that reason, it was put into the ajza. Um, and so that, that came later. That did not come from the Prophet or from the Salaf. It came later. Um, and then they, they did the Ahzab because they read it at Maghrib and As after Asr. So for instance, in, in Morocco, and believe it or not, every month there are 250,000 khatam in the masjids of Morocco. And that, that, that's been calculated by the Ministry of Awqaf. Since the time of the Muahidun, the Moroccans have been reciting the Quran in the masjid. Uh, and they do it, initially they did it between uh, after Fajr they did a hizb and then after uh, uh, asr because those are times people don't pray. So it was, it was uh, and those are the really good times for bit of ghadoui what asal, you know, those are the times to do dhikr. That's when the birds all congregate and do their dhikr. So, uh, um, so, uh, so that's why they did that. And then they put the thuman was for memorization because you would do like the thuman, the ruba. So beginning students would write the, the one eighth of a hizb, and then the uh, then they would move to a thuman, and then they would move like to nusf al hizb, and then they some would, could learn even faster than that. So those are all to help us um, recite the Quran. Uh, my personal uh, experience is I really like using the Quran mujazza, which is. Uh, th that has 30 uh, different um, booklets because um, it facilitates for doing a, a, a word of the Quran. And my advice to everybody is just abandon all these other awrad that you're doing and just do, do the Quran. Because traditionally the awrad were on, in addition to the Quran. Now people do the awrad and they don't do the Quran. Those awrad were done in addition to the Quran. So it's very important if you're not doing a word of Quran every day, 
you should not be doing these other awrad. If you're doing, if you're reciting the Quran once a month and you want to do more, you can either do more of the Quran or you can do the awrad. The adhkar al-sabah wa masa are actually preferred at that time, but the, you can do a very short version of them. They're not, they're not, you don't, you don't have to do these extensive. I'll tell you something, a secret that I've realized. There's two reasons. It used to bother me that there were so many books on tajweed. Like it really bothered me. Like why do the ulama write books? There's, there's like a million books on tajweed. And they all say exactly the same thing. There's no difference, any of them. They all say the exact same. Some of them are a little better produced than others, or they might have a little. But they all say, then I realize I want to write a book on Tajweed because it's brilliant. Everybody that learns from your book, you get the reward of all their recitations. So it just makes perfect sense why there's millions of books on Tajweed. It's actually a really smart thing to do. And this is the same with the Aurat. The Shiuch are really smart. And so they all wanted, you know, if you're reciting the word of Imam al-Shadiri or Sidi Ahmed Zarruq or Imam al-Haddad or they're getting all the reward of your dhikr. So it's actually really smart to do that. So this idea somehow that, you know, we abandon the, I mean, this is what I think really created a lot of the Salafi impulse was to see how far people were getting away from these fundamental things. Um, you know, the people that are doing, uh, you know, mawlid, uh, all the time and they're not reciting the Quran and things like that. So th these are things that we have to really think about. Um, so I would definitely uh, advise having a word of the Quran, even if it's one page, you know, you, you'll get better. If, if you get good at reciting the Quran, you can recite um, a, a juz in you know, 20 minutes with a hadar, you know, I mean, there's three um, modes of recitation. If you do the, the, uh, the longer uh, mode of uh, tartil, then it's gonna, it's gonna take longer. But if you do the hadar, you, you, the hadar, you, can, you can get through it uh, in, in, uh, in 20 minutes. And, and uh, there's a great blessing in doing that. Every, and in, in the Moroccan method, you, you, you know where you are, like you know today's 17th day, which is Badr, by the way, you know. Uh, so may Allah bless the Shuhada of Badr and all the people that uh, uh, s supported the Prophet ﷺ at that time. Um, so that, that's a great blessing to, to do it. You begin with the lunar month and then you'll always know where you are in the lunar month. So you'll know, uh, like, is, is this the... 16th or 17th night, you know, that we're coming into um, b based on the moon sighting. So that's how they do it in Morocco. So, so I would really recommend that uh, to, we need to get back to the Quran devotionally, but also practically uh, using it. Um, I have a, a, a friend, he's a really brilliant scholar in uh, Kuwait, uh, very, very, uh, uh, engaging person and wonderful to spend time with um, has a really phenomenal memory but um, uh, his name is Sheikh Abdullah Ma'atouq uh, he runs the uh, uh, supporting the the uh, Iratha there and uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayed did something with him where they fed a billion meals uh, Alhamdulillah so anyway he, he does 30 khatam every Ramadan you know, and so he, he that's all he does. Like he's Ramadan just, so he had a friend of his, you know, in, in, uh, in Kuwait who wanted to go to Medina with him and do the khatam. You know, I'm gonna, I want to do it every day with you. The, he said, no, no, this takes a lot of training. It's like a marathon, right? So he said, no, it takes a lot. No, he said, I can do it, I can do it. So he went there and he said, after Fajr, you know, he was, because you have to recite really fast to do as a sleep. <laughs> so take what you can bear, you know, like just take what you're able to. I'm going to do last question, then we're done. So. Okay, Bismillah. We had several votes for a particular question to be asked, and that is, what is so special about Surat Yasin? 
Yasin is called the heart of the Quran. You know, it's the 36th chapter of the Quran. The actual physical heart of the Quran, you know, the wasat al Quran is Isra, which is quite extraordinary. So the 17th chapter is the one that is the 15th juz. It begins the, the second half of the Quran. But Yasin, the Prophet said, Iqra'u Yasin ala mawtakum. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, some of the hadiths are weak, but, but the scholars have taken them up uh, as ha having benefits. So, but everything has a heart, and the heart of the Quran uh, is, is Yasin. Yasin, to me, is an extraordinary death meditation from beginning to end. So if you on your path, and it's falling into ghafla, the heedlessness of dunya, which really is what leads people astray. And that's why events like this are so important for humanity, even though we're going to see a lot of hardships and may Allah help us. People have to have strong iman. This is a time to really get prepared because what's coming is, 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 is going to be extremely difficult on people. The, the thing to remember is why you read the Quran, the Prophet he said that, that the previous people were sawed in half to leave their faith and they still wouldn't leave their faith. Like he was saying to the Sahaba, you do not know tribulation. You know, like you think this is difficult. I mean, they burnt Christians alive. You know, they, they fed them to the lions laughing, watching it happen. And in fact, many of the Stoics in Rome converted to Christianity because of what they saw with these Christians that were being fed to the lions because they would just, they were all praying and they, they didn't panic and they didn't, and it, it, were the, it, it, it was that type of faith that really had the impact. And Muslims know death, you know, Muslims know tr struggle. You look at the Palestinians, I mean, it's amazing what, what the Palestinians have been through in, in our, and the fact that so many of them still believe, I mean, there are some really secular Palestinians, but overall the Palestinians, it's quite extraordinary um, how they've held on to faith, despite the fact they've been in some pretty horrific, especially the people in, 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 uh, in the West Bank and in Gaza, I mean, in the occupied territories, have been really difficult times. So Muslims know these tribulations, uh, and, and uh, so that's, that's important to remember. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, bless all of you, increase you, elevate you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the اللهم تقبل منا صيامنا وقيامنا مع تقصيرنا نحن مقصرون ونعترف بتقصيرنا فنسألك يا رب العالمين أن تمن علينا يا منان يا حنان اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا اللهم بارك في, في المنفقين على الزيتونة إن شاء الله الله bless all those who support Zaytuna support our students support the college and Allah bless all of you that uh, have uh, uh, honored us by um, coming in and, and, and listening to what we have to say. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and increase you. Really request um, support uh, for the college. It's a difficult time. I'm very aware of that, but um, we, we really need your support to grow and to, to do more, inshallah, for the deen. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanna rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamu al-anamu salim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ameen. صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما